is uh, Antoinette Matthews, and I'm the Executive Director of the MIT Enterprise Forum. For those of you that are just joining us now, I'm joined today by my colleague, uh, Marcy Rizzo, who's Senior Content Producer for MIT Technology Review. So we're going to be talking today about the 10 breakthrough technologies, um, which is a, a good interest piece. Um, but I just want to describe to you how we you know, what the 10 breakthrough technologies really are as part of our um, special feature. So we're, the 10 breakthrough technologies are a special annual feature that is produced online and in print by MIT Technology Review, which is an independent media company that is owned by MIT. And uh, it, is, it's, it's, uh, it, it talks about um, emerging technologies, and that is really the global conversation that it is holding. So MIT Technology Review leads the global conversation about technologies that matter. That's very important because MIT's mission um, also includes the betterment of mankind. Um, so we like to talk about technologies that matter. It's an independent media company owned by MIT and it produces publications read by millions of business leaders, innovators and thought leaders around the globe in six languages and on a variety of platforms. The company publishes a magazine, which I've just shown you, and it's the most respected technology magazine, producing daily news features, analysis, opinion, and business reports. The company's entrepreneurial community organization, which is us, the MIT Enterprise Forum, which you've joined today, um, its mission is to inform, connect, and coach early stage tech entrepreneurs so that they can succeed faster. So in summary, that's who we are and that's why we're here today. And one of the, break, one of the special features that we're going to present to you on is uh, the 10 breakthrough technologies. So I hope that clarifies things. So I think it's good to first define what we mean by breakthrough. It's simple, really. It's an advance that gives people a powerful new way to use technology. It might be a user interface that's uh, technology, technologically advanced and gives you new opportunities to interact. It might be um, an intuitive experimental device that might enable people who have suffered traumatic injury. Um, it could be the key to sustainable development. Uh, it could be um, changing how we communicate with each other, how we interact and enable each other's uh, entrepreneurial efforts, business efforts, and global communication. It's, it's across fields and across industries. So as a whole, this annual list is intended to describe not only the technologies that we think you need to know about, but also to celebrate the creativity and the people behind these efforts. So, how do we choose the breakthrough technologies? We identify the problem, we find the breakthrough, we then identify the key players in that, in that field, and then we explain why it matters. And that's how the sequence that we're going to be following today for all 10 of these breakthrough technologies. So over the years, we've identified many technologies. Um, it's difficult to predict which ones um, you know, will be absorbed by the dynamics of the global markets. Um, and the impact of such, as, such events like um, the Ebola crisis, war and natural disasters. So what we're first going to do before we jump into these 10 breakthroughs is we're going to look a little bit um, over the last 10 years and see how well we fared. You know, what, which ones did we call right and, and where did we bomb? So anybody that's ever bought anything on Amazon knows what it's like to have that little pop-up message come and say, since you bought The Count of Monte Cristo, we think you're going to like this book. Or since you bought these shoes, we know you're going to like this. People have your data, and, they, and there's a lot of it. So as reported in 2001, Usama Fayed was nominated. Um, he he kind of coined the phrase big data, and at the time, no one knew what big data was. He uh, was part of an organization called the DMX Group, which in 2004 was then um, acquired by Yahoo, where he is now chief officer of uh, research and development. So we got that one right. 
and nobody was talking about big data in 2001, right? So, where did we bomb? For some reason in 2010, we thought that the internet and social TV and TV would somehow merge. I don't know why we thought that, but we did, and we're still waiting. But in summary, Marie Jose Montpetit, an invited scientist at MIT's research lab, um, has been working for several years on social TV and a way to seamlessly combine the social networks that are boosting TV ratings with the more passive experience of traditional viewing. Her goal is to make watching television something that viewers in different places can share and discuss and to make it easier to find something to watch. That never really happened though. Nope. Back to a success now. Right, Wes, yes, we did have, uh, and this is our last success we're gonna share with you in the past before we take you uh, for a walk through 2014 nominations. So everyone knows Siri. That was a good call on our part. Adam Chayer is uh, the founder of this technology. He's um, now with a stealth startup called Viv Labs, and they're taking artificial intelligence to a new level. Right now, Siri's limited. Um, Siri can respond uh, to the tasks that Apple engineered and implemented, um, but uh, Adam Chayer and his new team at Viv Labs now claim that um, this new level of artificial intelligence has is limitless. You'll be able to, let's say you're going to a friend's house for dinner. You can ask your phone, knowing you might have lamb, what kind of wine to bring, and then ask where you should stop on the way to their house to get it. That's yet to be seen, but it's coming. Okay, and so let's take a look at the top 10 emerging technologies uh, nominations that were awarded uh, by MIT TR for 2014. Breakthrough technology number one, the problem. Machines with legs fall over. So in the field of robotics, engineers really struggle with this. It, it's, the challenge is machine agility. And we almost feel sorry for that little guy, right? So, breakthrough. Agile robots. Agile robots, legged machines that stride over uneven or unsteady terrain. Walking is an extraordinary feat of biomechanical engineering. Anyone who has ever watched a baby get its sea legs know this. Meet Atlas, a robot created by Boston Dynamics that Google acquired in 2013. Atlas has an exceptional sense of balance using high-powered hydraulics and can stabilize itself and show the capabilities that robots need to move around safely in human environments. Some of the applications. Think about it. And that's Boston, by the way. And that'll, do you understand now why we like to come to Greece? <laughs> Actually, you know, I, I saw this in action by accident one day. It, they, they, Boston Dynamics um, takes, uh, gets the benefit of this giant park not far from where I live. And one day I was taking a walk in this park. I never heard of this guy before. And they were, he came out before I saw any humans anywhere. And it's gigantic. It's the size of a bison. And it's doing all these exercises. And I'm, I'm mystified by this because I see no people anywhere. Just this giant machine. Um, eventually over the hill I did see who they were. And I ran. I didn't even, you know, I, I, I was astounded. So this happens in my backyard, basically. <laughs> But what, tell us about the applications uh, as an idea. So I think that, that uh, emergency rescue operations, um, fulfilling routine tasks for the disabled, like helping you find your glasses. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we don't exactly know Google's intentions in, in this acquisition, but I think it's going to be an interesting um, technology to watch um, unfold. But why does it matter? Well. We need machines that can navigate the human world. Key players, as you know, Boston Dynamics Shaft and Honda. Technology breakthrough number two. Problem, governments are vacuuming up personal data. Mm. So on January 21st, 
as protesters thronged a square in Ukraine, a message came up on every single person's cell phone. The message came from number 111, and it said, we know that you are part of a mass demonstration. And there was a little more. Yes, dear subscribers, you are registered as participants in a mass disturbance. I mean, that was sent to every phone in the protest zone. I know that we all understand that um, the age of privacy is gone, um, but that sort of thing is incredibly disturbing. If we weren't so jaded in the familiarity of people taking our data, crunching it up and using it, um, that would be much more offensive than it is at this moment. But think about it. So the breakthrough here is ultra-private smartphones for consumers that transmit minimal personal data. <coughs> so modern apps and the apps that run through them are engineered to collect and disseminate enormous amounts of data, whether it be web browser history, location, contact lists, and much more. These custom security phones, they're not new really. I mean, they've been used by governments for, for some time with perhaps the exception of Angela Merkel, which would have saved Obama some face, but you know, what, we can't do anything that about that. That would have been useful, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but what, it, what is new about it is that it's starting to become, um, in the, it's starting to be used by consumers. Uh, this is because of the price point is going down and, and, and it's becoming more uh, available. So how do these work? Um, the, it's an amalgamation of technologies. It's hardware um, and encryption tools that, uh, go through private servers and give access codes to each user. So a black phone is now $629, yeah. for example. I think the most, one of the most important points that we can point out here is, is that these are not phone companies adding privacy features. These are privacy companies selling phones. Important. Um, Key players? Key players, Black Phone, Open Whisper Systems, and Cryptophone. And why does it matter? Sorry, Marcy. No. Surveillance is incompatible with privacy, personal dignity, and citizenship. I did want to add one more thing is, is if you think about if anybody has, I don't have children, but if you think about anyone that, have, that has teenage children, um, and the mistakes the that they have made over the past uh, perhaps by posting something on Facebook that was perhaps inappropriate. Um, the day of, the, we're now in the age of needing our privacy more than ever before. Okay, so, breakthrough technology number three. Do we have any burning questions at this point? 3D printing is limited to plastic prototypes. Um, of either a metal alloy or industrial scale parts. So those of you that heard Marina talk earlier and, and it's been in the, in the forefront for some time now, 3D printing is causing a lot of excitement. But the advance of the technology and its use has been limited by the materials it's constrained by, typically plastics or metal alloys. Um, but what if 3D printers could use materials that range from semiconductors, uh, mixing and match, or living cells or uh, electrodes, mixing and matching all kinds of materials, and matching these inks, which are the very materials that are laid down in this case, uh, with intent and precision. Microscale 3D printing that creates objects like biological tissue. So this new version of additive manufacturing is all about precisely adding materials that are useful for their mechanical properties. Um, electrical connectivity, optical traits, uh, really it's transforming 3D technology to make objects that sense and respond to their environment. So for example, um, it integrates form and function. It, imagine a, a glove that is embedded with electrical connectivity and it could sense all kinds of things about your health, well-being, your state of disease. Um, ultimately, the idea down the road is that has a, holds a possibility to create uh, living organs. 
talk about applications? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, you know, the key players in this, um, at, at Princeton University, they've been working on uh, a bionic ear. At Cambridge University, they've been printing retinal cells um, in, in complex eye structures. Um, the Lewis team at Harvard, who we just heard at our recent event in Cambridge, um, where they're successfully printing microscopic electrodes and other components needed to create lithium batteries. Um, they're now working on sensors that are printed and fabricated on plastic patches that, for example, uh, athletes can wear um, to sense uh, as a preemptive strike against concussions. So I think that there are many obstacles that we need to overcome before these labs can print out a kidney or a fresh liver. But that's where we're on our way to solving the complexity of transferring knowledge from the printing of synthetic particles to the artificial tissue capabilities of the complex biological functions found in organs. So that's astounding stuff right there. And as a result, uh, Jennifer Lewis from Harvard University um, ha is actually one of our innovators under 35 award winners which is a, um, a, a competition winner offered by MIT Technology Review. Uh, much like the competition that's being offered by MIT uh, Enterprise Forum in Greece. So uh, good things are happening there. So why does this matter? Printing biomaterials will lead to artificial organs and cyborg parts. Breakthrough technology number four, problem. Much of today's office work is done outside an office. So it's taken a while for the software to catch up with the habits of people today. Everybody works on multiple devices all over the place, planes, trains, and automobiles. Um, now, there are new apps that make this easier to manage. Uh, we all know them, Dropbox, um, storage applications that are now much easier to use, cheaper, cheaper and uh, hold more information. Um, and meanwhile, these things are, uh, your data is your data's easily kept in sync. This is all kind of old news, but, but these applications that we're talking about here are the next step in development. Right, breakthrough. Mobile collaboration services make it fruitful to work on mobile documents on mobile devices. So the most interesting new mobile collaboration services capture the stream of collaboration communications in emails and conversations around the water cooler, so to speak. The new document editing apps uh, capture the stream of this communication and then grab that often critical to mission conversation that has in the past fallen off the radar. Some of the key players here, Quip, Quick Office, Box Dropbox, Microsoft, Google and cloud on. And why does it matter? Workers are liberated from PCs and it opens the door to new work productivity apps. So breakthrough technology problem number five, renewable energy is intermittent. So big data and artificial intelligence are producing ultra accurate forecasts that now make it finally feasible to integrate much more renewable energy, energy into the grid. The breakthrough is smart wind and solar power, which takes advantage of big data and artificial intelligence for ultra accurate forecasting. Has anybody here ever seen a giant wind farm with, with the turbines that are, they're, the scale is amazing. And, uh, yeah, don't you think they're incredible? Uh, they really are. And so imagine for a minute, just scale that to hundreds of turbines somewhere in eastern Colorado on a vast plain, and uh, they're working furiously. So in every few seconds, almost every one of these hundreds of turbines records the wind speed, and then its own power output. And then every five minutes, it dispatches this data to a, a supercomputer. That data is then, um, artificial intelligence software takes that data, combines it with other information like from weather stations, uh, satellites, and crunches the numbers. And it's, it's quite unprecedented. Uh, the power forecasts are 
have, show accuracy that have never been available before, and finally make it possible to put wind power on the, on the map realistically, because it measures, it, it delivers power to demand. The fact is, this, is, this has already been proven. There's a, um, a large utility company in the States called Excel, and they have shown a savings um, three times over what they, what they previously had before these numbers were, before they had the algorithms to crunch these numbers. So mining these detailed forecasts to develop more flexible and efficient electricity systems promise to make it much cheaper to hit ambitious global goals for emissions reduction uh, by matching power production to electricity demand, turning plants off and on, and controlling output. Some of the key players, Excel Energy, GE Power, and then the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And why does it matter? So we'll be able to integrate wind and solar into the electrical grid. Because they'll then take that same model for solar energy. So it, it, it shows that it can be done, and that's, that's been the, the biggest argument for, one of the biggest arguments against renewable energy, is that it doesn't measure, you can't measure, um, manage demand. So breakthrough technology number six. Problem. Virtual reality is the tech of the future, but it always has been. <laughs> so 30 years after virtual reality goggles and immersive virtual worlds made their debut, the technology finally seems nearly ready for widespread use. So this goofy machine that you see on the screen, um, this is the daddy, actually, of this technology. It was then called multi-sensory, now multimodal technology. His name is Morton Hellig, and this was, um, he developed this prototype in 1962. He saw theater as an all senses activity and called it experience theater. He built this prototype seen here, along with five short films, and this functionality, it, it's, still, it's still working and you can still see it. Um, I don't know where it is though, we haven't, I haven't figured that out yet, but it would be amazing to see. There's been books written about this effort and all kinds of publications on it. It's ca virtual reality has captured the imagination of people for a long, long time, um, but it finally seems that an, uh, a kid uh, in his garage put some stuff together um, really out of just nothing but a love of playing video games. So the breakthrough, Oculus Rift and virtual reality hardware cheap enough for consumers. So the best known virtual reality player in the market today is Oculus VR, a company that's on the verge of releasing the Rift, an affordable VR headset for playing ultra immersive video games. With $91 million in venture funding behind Oculus, Facebook bought it uh, for $2 billion last spring. While video games are where this improved VR technology is likely to take off first, the implications across industries are huge. Uh, telepresence, architecture, computer-aided design, emergency response therapy, phobia therapies, um, and many companies are following suit. One of the most interesting things about Oculus Rift is, of course, its CEO, uh, Lucky Palmer, who again, a, had, ne had no engineering background whatsoever. He was a 16-year-old. He didn't get what he wanted. He didn't see it on the market, and he built a prototype in his garage, refined it until he had what he wanted. And um, he's now the young CEO of this company. Key players, Oculus, VR, Sony, Vozix, and NVIDIA. And why does it matter? Visually immersive, user interface will lead to new forms of entertainment and communications. So, breakthrough technology number seven. Problem. Traditional chips are reaching <coughs> fundamental performance limits. Microprocessors configured more like brains than traditional chips could soon make computers far more astute about what is going on around them. At MTech recently, which is the signature annual conference of MIT Technology Review, held at <coughs> this year at MIT's Media Lab, the company Qualcomm gave us a glimpse of the future uh, with a robot performing tasks 
that have typically needed powerful, specially programmed computers that use an enormous amount of electricity. This robot, whose name is Pioneer, is powered by a smartphone chip with specialized software that enables it to recognize objects that it hasn't seen before and then sort them according to similarly related objects, delivering them to a designated location. So Pioneer is effectively simulating how the brain works. Uh, I saw this robot in action at MTech, and it looks like a little dinosaur. Um, and it moves in the most extraordinary way. And it looks like it's working on its own, but of course it's got a controller, the man behind it, with a smartphone. But it's really an extraordinary thing to watch. So some of the applications. Um, transforming smartphones and other devices into cognitive companions that pay attention to your actions and surroundings that will come to know your habits. So anticipating your needs and then recording them and responding to them. It could lead to glasses for the blind that use visual and auditory sensors to recognize objects. And computers that draw on wind patterns, tides, and other indicators that could even predict tsunamis, for example. So why does it matter? Mobile devices will become cognitive companions that learn our habits. Problem number eight, breakthrough technology problem number eight. We don't yet fully understand the brain's anatomy. So a new map, decades in the making and the result of global collaboration, shows neural structures in far greater detail than ever before, providing si neuroscientists with a guide to the brain's immense complexity. Picture a 3D atlas of the brain. It has 50 times the resolution of anything available previously. It required slicing the brain into thousands and thousands of thin sections and then digitally stitching them back together. It, it, it's done with the help of supercomputers and the goal is a reference brain um, that actually reflects the true cellular structure. Um, it's a daunting goal for many reasons, not just computational. Um, a brain might contain several metabytes of data, and presently that can't be navigated in real time. And, and apparently it's, it's not so easy to slice a brain thinly. So the breakthrough is brain mapping in high resolution that shows structures of the brain as small as 20 micrometers. And I don't know exactly how small that is, but I just know it's very, 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 very small unit of management. <laughs> <laughs> so the key players here are Alan Evans, Carl Dyseroth, and Katrine Amantz. New techniques are being developed that allow scientists to see the arrangements of cells and nerve fibers <coughs> inside brain tissue at a very high resolution. The problem in the past is that the fat lipids in the, bl in the brain block the light so that the structures of the neurons and the circuitry can't be seen. Uh, but now there's a technique that replaces this opacity with a gel-like substance that enables resolution-making three-dimension reconstruction feasible. And why does it matter? So neuroscientists need a detailed map of the brain to understand how it works. Technology breakthrough number nine, problem. Drones are expensive and mostly used by governments to spy on or kill people. So relatively cheap drones are, are um, available now and they have advanced sensors and imaging capabilities and they're giving farmers uh, new ways to increase yields and reduce crop damage. So using what was once military aviation technology to grow better grapes, for example, using pictures from the air, Drones are part of a broader trend of using sensors and robotics to bring big data to precision agriculture. It's one simple low cost solution to feeding a projected 9.6 billion population by 2050. So the software plans the, uh, the flight plan, um, aiming for maximum coverage of a vineyard, let's say, 
and controls a camera to optimize images for later analysis. Compared with satellite images, it's not only cheaper but offers a higher resolution. So the, the, the hardware itself isn't, isn't the news here. It's really the data. Um, it's the ability to see and transmit um, such a, a, a big picture to understand what to improve, how to improve, what's going on in the field, and preemptive, <coughs> preemptively solve some of those problems. Players? So the breakthrough is agricultural drones that are easy to use, equipped with cameras and priced under $1,000. Players in the field right now are 3D Robotics, Yamaha, and Precision Hawk. Why it matters? Close monitoring of crops could improve water use and pest management. And it sounds like also give us better wine. Yeah, true. So breakthrough number 10, we cannot modify genes easily. Uh, last November, female twin monkeys were born in China to a sprawling research center there. Um, their DNA at specific locations on chromosomes were altered with a new genome tool known as CRISPR, proving it's possible to create primates with intentional and precise genetic mutations. Breakthrough here. The genome editing tool called CRISPR created two monkeys with very specific genetic mutation. So I, I just want to stress that these two monkeys are alive and healthy and happy today and living in China. We're, we're actually not sure how happy they are. <laughs> Really. <laughs> so the lab where the, this experiment was performed includes micro-injection systems, which are microscopes pointed at a petri dish, and two precision needles controlled by levers and dials. Relatively simple. These are used both for injecting sperm into the eggs and for the gene editing, which uses guide RNA that directs a DNA-cutting enzyme into genes. So the creation of primates with international gene alterations could lead to powerful new ways to study complex human diseases. But this does pose an ethical question of just because you can doesn't mean you should. So now you need to ask yourself if you had the opportunity to modify your future child's genes to edit out the gene of autism, the question to you ethically is, would you do it? But this technology really isn't about designer babies. It's, it's meant to study, um, to focus on, on certain brain disorders for the purpose of study, like, like um, autism or Parkinson's. And right now, um, one of these monkeys, they've is now revealing symptoms of, of autism. So it, it's pretty amazing. Um, the key players, Antoinette? Feng Zhang at MIT, uh, George Church, and uh, let's not forget the Yunnan Key Laboratory where these monkeys are actually housed. Ming Ming and Ling Ling are their names. And why does it matter? The ability to modify targeted genes in primates is a valuable tool in the study of human diseases, such as schizophrenia, bipolar, autism, <coughs> and Alzheimer's. So I think just to close, why does any of this matter? New technologies solve big problems. It also enables new possibilities. Technology is not an absolute good. We must talk about how we want to use new technologies and not be used by them. Thank you very much.
about uh, the drones, except the agriculture, uh, the agricultural field. Um, are there any other aspects that would uh, you uh, tell us that drones uh, or babies are? Well, this particular study was actually used specifically for agriculture. Um, I think the applications for that uh, are are probably vast. Um, but in yes, go ahead. If I am correct, uh, I think that uh, in the United States, uh, drones are uh, allowed to uh, fly all over uh, cities yes. uh, from now on. Yes, but they're also getting shot down. <laughs> as long as they don't fly above up to a certain, um, if, as long as they don't. Um, fly up to a certain height, they can roam freely. But there has been questions about privacy, because they can capture so much more high imaging and they can, you know, look into your bedroom window. Okay. So, yes, there are, there are so concerns there. So the privacy uh, issues that Right. Uh, okay. Yes, there is a problem with the privacy issues. There's been a lot of uh, context, context around that. But I think, in summary, again, it comes back to the point of technology is not an absolute evil or an absolute good. It's how you apply it, and we're in control of that. So I think fundamentally the message here is, is, is not about how the technology can be evil, but that it is our responsibility as citizens to really understand the technology, and we are in control of how it gets applied. Because if you are using it to manage water, and you are using it to throw into the caves of uh, terrorists so that soldiers don't get blown up, you're using it for an absolute good. Um, but if you're starting to genetically modify genes or you're starting to peer into people's bedroom windows, then you're using it for, for worse. That is not a technology problem, that's a human problem. But it, it brings up an, a, a really uh, fascinating discussion about privacy, which is in almost every one of these technologies we just reported on, there's a privacy issue. There's an invasive issue. Um, and it, it's, it's part of, it seems, technological development. It's a conversation that needs to be had on a continuous, in a continuous way. Um, so what your question, I think, is, is provocative. And, and there's no end to it. And there's no answer for it. Thank you very much. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Yes. question about the last uh, great technology which has to do with the gene modification of the monkeys. So you said the monkeys, one of them has uh, uh, reduced some symptoms of obvious right? Yes. Yeah. Was that deliberate? Um, yes. yes. So there was a specific modification in its uh, DNA in order to generate an obvious product kind of specific gene? Yeah. That's, that, that's exactly yeah. right. When Antoinette described the, the petri dish, where the, the microscope is directed in injecting the, through RNA onto the chromosome, they're injecting uh, that genetic variant for the sole purpose to cause that disease for future study. Now, that's invasive. There were two monkeys. There are two monkeys. Yes, there are two. The, the one that was healthy. No, they're both healthy. They're both healthy, and I, but I think that in, so both these monkeys right now are perfectly healthy. Okay, everybody, the monkeys are great. <laughs> um, but yes, they are now starting to um, inject. They're starting to edit genes in other monkeys so that they can in, give them the, uh, uh, the, the 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 genetically modified disease. Um, so that they can actually observe it. And I think it's very important that you ask that question because right now we're not, we're trying to just review. We're just monitoring, we're just viewing it. We're trying to see and monitor what, what happens if we, give the, if we uh, edit that gene. That's my understanding. Well, they, there was some attempts in, from this article um, and what the editors who reviewed this technology shared with us that they started to do these studies on brain disorders in mice. They've been doing that for a long, long time. But they don't provide the outcomes that are usable uh, to, to apply to the human population. They found that in, by, with primates, they're able to get much closer accuracy and understanding of how, um, as, as an, a brain equivalent. 
So this development with a primate in this way of injecting a genetic mutation that causes this disease is an opportunity to research these diseases which are so unknown um, and so difficult to treat and of such vast impact on the populations of the world um, that they're, they're taking this first step in this way. And this is the first example of this actually happening. Um, and we don't know yet what will be. But that's the purpose. Uh, just a quick comment on what was heard before about the gentleman in the red shirt. I just wanted to mention that. Okay. Hmm. I just wanted to mention a, an application that is also particularly important for Greece uh, in the drone, or the drone application, drone technology application, which is the counter piracy operations. We usually use drones, and it's been marketed that way, the, the drone weapons to deploy against pirates. In the sense of protecting ships, even mm -hmm. forewarning for piracy and other in open seas or in other these environments, giving uh, yeah. forewarning to people so that they may navigate environmental navigation safe. So it's not a quantum unidimensional application. Right. There's, there's, the applications that I imagine, but not an expert beyond the civil uh, uh, operations, but I would say that I totally agree with the fact that drones should be on your watch list in the coming years for not just agricultural or police work, pretty much everything that there is an uh, uh, aviation dimension. Did you want to respond? No, actually, I don't have a comment about this. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. I, you know, something, something that really rings true in reading about these technologies and, and learning about them I mean, what is the big deal? You see a seven-foot robot picking up objects from one bucket and moving it across the aisle to another bucket. I mean, or, or you have a drone flying over a, a, a vineyard. It, it hardly seems worth the trouble. But it's in imagining the applications where it becomes so incredibly interesting and, and rife with possibility. Um, so the fact that these things are happening, one has to extrapolate as to the possibilities. Um, and that's really across all of these um, nominated technologies. And it, it's not easy to think about this and, and what it could mean. Um, but it, it's worth consideration. But it's very interesting uh, if you know how these technologies make money. Uh, say that again. How they make money. Oh. Yes, the comment is it's very interesting to understand how these technologies can generate money. Correct? Yes. Right. So that's not where we're at yet with the 10 breakthrough technology. So <laughs> at the moment we're... Uh, uh, but that is the role of the MIT Enterprise Forum um, about scaling these uh, the, for profitability. But right now it's too early. These are big investments. They are not showing, yielding returns at this moment. But it's a good... Of course, a good question. But, uh, you mentioned uh, about privacy and ethics. Um, it has to do a little bit with the morality of the human being, the yes. human race. So I'm, th I'm staring at those ten global technology trends, and I don't really see any helping the poor. Uh, they're not, maybe, maybe the German they can do it in, in, uh, later, later on. But most of them are to create the uh, wealth for the wealthier and to create uh, value for the society, but for the for, for not the poor, but more for the wealth, for the wealth um, For example, now we take the Ebola. I see a uh, text editing the messaging uh, is helping the Ebola not to uh, spread. Uh, for, for the people, for the poor people, to, to be informed on how to treat the, the patients and what to do in order to take care of the patients. Just, just that. Uh, yeah. An observation. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, I, one could argue, though, that um, if you are going to be feeding the world, that is going to be 9.6 9 billion people in the year 250, and we, if we can't manage water on this planet, we won't have a planet in 2050.
use all this technology in order to, to find ways to, to, to create pure water, to create uh, food, Correct. instead of uh, doing absolutely. Great. Do we have any uh, closing question, um, remarks, anything? Do you believe that the breakthroughs, uh, you just presented all the breakthroughs, uh, the breakthroughs uh, we showed the last uh, maybe 20 years, 10 to 20 years, are bigger than the breakthroughs we show uh, in um, the industry and the development or the science fields uh, the previous uh, years? You mean this 2014 list or you mean Not only the, the industrial revolution versus technology yes. today? Yeah, I don't think technology has done much compared to, I, I think we've kind of flattened out, but that's a personal opinion. Yeah. What, what do you think? I believe, um, can, can anyone, do you have a mic? That all these technologies you just presented, uh, we're gonna, uh, are going to uh, make um, uh, big adjustments to our uh, uh, everyday life, of course. Uh, the first thing I see is that uh, uh, all technologies uh, weren't so uh, specific and uh, so um, uh, Yes, it's the application potential, <coughs> not necessarily the, the, the robot itself, the idea of the robot, but what, what, what's in potential uh, in its achievement and the way it's utilized. And I think the small change in technology, which we see is maybe quite kind of small, does have a huge impact on the way we live our lives. It does have an enormous impact because now um, people are not going to be going to the office as much. It's too expensive to house all of us together. It's becoming too expensive and they're not making any more land. So um, working remotely is going to change our lifestyle entirely. Um, and yes, some machines are going to take jobs from people. There's no question about it. They're already starting to take jobs from people. But do you want your child to be working in a factory? Come on. I think that the Industrial Revolution, everybody panicked that, oh, they weren't going to have jobs. But we adapted. We just found better jobs. So, so do you see the next 20 years our life to change uh, in a more positive way than uh, the industrial uh, revolution changed uh, the everyday life? Well, something's lost and something's gained, always, right? I mean, when you no longer go to the bank and talk to a teller and have a communication that's live and a real exchange with another human being, um, you do that now with your phone in your room all alone. It's almost cliche, everyone knows this, but we, these impacts are long in effect and, and they're generational. I mean, my children grew up in a different world than I'm in, completely. They don't know what clockwise means. They don't know what it's like to wait by the phone, to stay at home and wait for a phone call. They'll never know that. I mean, these are small things, but think about it. They're, they're you know, they're radically, they radically change generationally. 
Thank if you. If we don't have any more questions, would you like to have this discussion perhaps later um, over a glass of wine um, for the... Uh, well, one last one. question. Um, have you seen any, anything about the uh, virtual currency bitcoins? Um, I think it's a, it's a quite currency. big trend. It's right? Bitcoin yeah. currency. It didn't make it onto our 2014 list specifically. We didn't think, think that it... At, for the purpose of dis curing disease, um, saving water, new energy solutions, we generally try to talk about technologies that matter. We, we, we didn't cover that for that very specific reason. It doesn't mean that it isn't a new breakthrough technology. Uh, it's just that it didn't make it to our list, given the mission of the Technology Review magazine. Thank you very much and um, 